Hello, everyone. Welcome to the third annual National Science Policy Symposium. We apologize for our slight technical delay this morning. But we're really excited to have you all here. My name is Caitlin Warlick Short, and I am the Director of Communications for the National Science Policy Network. As I said, we're thrilled to have all of you here today, along with more than 30 different speakers, eight workshop hosts, and numerous other partners joining to contribute to conversations about how we can more effectively harness science policy for racial justice. So we invite you to actively engage in these conversations throughout the weekend, both in the scheduled sessions and also via our symposium app and social media channels. We're excited to see where these conversations take us and in particular what projects, initiatives, and coalitions for change might find new strength or take on new shape from this work. This year's symposium has been made possible by our generous uh, sponsorship from our funders. So um, in particular, um, we're very excited um, and thankful for the support from the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, along with the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, the Kavli Foundation, the David and Lucille Packard Foundation, Smith Futures, Issues uh, in Science and Technology Magazine, um, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and the California Council for Science and Technology. So before we get things kicked off with a conversation between our two fantastic keynote speakers, I wanted to cover just a few logistics. If you're not there already, you can access all symposium sessions and events through our web app at join.scipolsymposium.org. If you experience any technical difficulties with Zoom or other sessions throughout the weekend, please reach out to our tech support team for this event, all pro audiovisuals, at the email or phone number below. And these will also be in the chat as well. If you have any code of conduct concerns throughout the weekend, please email conduct at scipolnetwork.org. And you can also review our code of conduct policy on the symposium website. So in addition to Zoom, we'll be using a number of other platforms and services this weekend. Closed captioning for all the sessions will be powered by Otter AI. To access the transcript, you're just going to go ahead and click on the small arrow to the right of the Otter AI banner at the top left of your Zoom screen. This will create a drop down menu that includes a link to view the live transcript in your browser. You can also find this link in the chat. Our agenda, conversation forums, engagement contests, and details about all sessions are hosted on the Whova app, which you can access through your web browser or mobile device. Finally, we'll be using Remo as our virtual exhibit hall for networking events and the career fair, um, which will be happening tomorrow, as well as flash talk uh, Q&A discussions. Um, both this afternoon and tomorrow. And these links can be found in the Whova app as well as announcements from our symposium team throughout the weekend. So our agenda for today will kick off in just a few minutes here with an opening keynote conversation. This will be followed by several panel discussions, workshops, flash talks, and networking events. We'll conclude today with Friday Night Trivia hosted by the Fax Machine podcast. Don't worry, there's still time to participate tonight if you haven't signed up yet. You can sign up as either an individual or with a team of up to six people by 7.30 p.m. tonight um, at the link, which again is also on our app and in the chat. So before we get started um, here in just a moment, I'd like to share one final symposium engagement opportunity with you. So really excited this year, our communications team has put together some symposium bingo. You can play either on Twitter or on Instagram and be sure to tag at SciPol Network and use the hashtags iSpySciPol and NSPS2020. The first 10 attendees to complete bingo will win $15 store credit to our NSPN store. All right, so I think we have a few minutes here yet, but I want to give them plenty of time to speak. Uh, so with that, 
I will just go ahead um, and I'd like to extend a generous welcome to our opening keynote speakers. We're incredibly grateful to have um, both uh, Gilda Barabino and Suda Parikh joining us today. I wanna keep their introductions relatively brief to maximize our time with Gilda and Suda. You can read more about both of them on our website where you'll find their bios. Uh, but before we start, I wanted to share just one fun fact about each of them that um, might bring a little bit of extra or different light uh, to their perspective in this conversation. So uh, if you have read her um, Wikipedia profile, you might know this, but otherwise it may come as a surprise to you or, may, or maybe not. Many of us have perhaps experienced this in our own lives, uh, but Gilda's STEM career began um, with an undergraduate degree in chemistry after a high school teacher told her that girls couldn't become chemists. And before uh, Sudip went on to study material science and structural biology, he was actually originally a journalism major. So again, we're very excited to have them here today and to um, hear everything that they have to say um, about the future of science policy and what it means to have science by all and for all. With that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to uh, Gilda and Sudit. And um, if you would like to engage, again, please use the Q&A function um, in Zoom and um, engage with us also on social media. Wonderful. Uh, well, thank you, Caitlin. Uh, uh, very much appreciate uh, being able to do this. I've been looking forward to this all day. So uh, uh, my name is Sudit Parikh, and uh, I have the privilege of being the CEO of the AAAS. Uh, and I get to I get to have a conversation with uh, with Gilda Barabino today, uh, and that is uh, that's truly exciting because uh, we've got to know each other a little bit over time. But I'm planning today, I'm hoping today, uh, to spend the next uh, 45 minutes uh, really learning uh, learning uh, how Gilda got to be Gilda. Uh, and then, uh, and then, how we, how she thinks about the past, the current, and the future of science policy, because there's a lot to unpack there, especially uh, with regard to what NSPN is doing. Um, uh, just a, a couple of quick words about that. I am, uh, I am so excited about what NSPN does. Uh, we've collaborated uh, with AAAS quite a bit, and seeing the energy. Uh, I often talk about the fact that uh, I see tremendous energy in the young scientists of today. Uh, the scientists who are at uh, in graduate school doing their postdocs and early career uh, and I see that manifested in NSPN so I'm truly excited about the conversation today and about uh, who is going to be asking us questions uh, throughout so uh, with that uh, let me uh, let me introduce uh, introduce Gilda. Um, Gilda is the president of Olin College uh, of Engineering uh, she's also a professor of biomedical and chemical engineering. And that's all I'm going to say right now, because we're going to go through this. We're going to learn a bit. So, uh, so Gilda, uh, I'm so glad we're doing this. Hello. Well, hi there. I'm so glad too. And, you know, as we get started first, let me just express my excitement and appreciation to be able to be with this group and to the network for what they've done. And also to applaud you, uh, Sudeep, and the AAAS and the network for all of the work in this space. It's very important. So just to give you a little bit about how I got to where I am right now, you heard a little bit about how I started out as a chemistry major, but I'll back it up a little bit more from, from that as well. Um, I was always very much interested in education and my parents instilled in me and my siblings the importance of education. But it wasn't just that education was an expectation, it's that you were supposed to excel at it as well. And um, I actually really, besides chemistry, what I really wanted to do was do early education. I wanted to teach young people and elementary school at that. I had some aptitude for chemistry and math and was actually pushed towards pre-medicine. I went to Xavier University of Louisiana, the only Black Catholic University in the country, historically Black college and university, and it was well known for producing a high number of Black medical doctors. So there was a real push towards medicine. And I was like, I'm actually kind of squeamish. I, I thought about doing medicine. I, I think I would, I know I would faint at the sight of blood. 
So I pursued engineering as a way to have uh, some impact in the medical field. So interestingly, when I started out in graduate school in chemical engineering at Rice University in 1981, it was only 15 years after they had first admitted African-Americans at the undergraduate and graduate level. So I was the first African-American that was admitted to the chemical engineering graduate program at Rice. I did my research in sickle cell disease. And part of my motivation for that is because I wanted to apply uh, engineering principles to medicine for a disease that disproportionately impacted African-Americans to give back to my community. So then I, when I went into academics, I joined a chemical engineering faculty at Northeastern in 89. And I was the first African-American female to be appointed in a tenure track position in chemical engineering in the nation. So I, you might get this sense of breaking down some barriers. Well, I, I continued doing sickle cell research. And here's something to note on the policy side. I did research as an investigator with the Boston Comprehensive Sickle Cell Center. And there was an act, a congressional act in 1972 that was called the National Sickle Cell Disease Control Act. And it was out of that act that 10 centers were set up across the country and Boston had one of them. So after Northeastern, I did a stint at Georgia Tech uh, as a, a professor and an administrator. And then in 2013, joined the City College of New York as Dean of Engineering and was the first African-American female to hold a deanship in engineering at an institution that was not a historically black college or university. And then, this past July, I became the second president of Olin College of Engineering. And what a time to become a new president, am I right? But I must say that my experiences to date, I think, have prepared me for this role at this time that we find ourselves in. And I'm fortunate to be joining a community that's known for innovation and constant change. It's wonderful, Gilda. There's so much to unpack there. Let's let's. Walk, I know, right? <laughs> let's walk through some of that. So, so just starting out, a lot of those things are first, right? Yes. Being the first, uh, the, the first of this and the first of that. Um, you you put it into a linear form, but but I mean, something tells me that it wasn't all linear, and that it wasn't uh, it wasn't just yes, this is something to celebrate, something to celebrate. What what were some of the challenges in being the first, um, and uh, and what were some of the challenges to making sure there's a second and a third? Yeah, uh -huh. so I'm glad you brought that up because I must say it wasn't easy. And there were times that I actually felt like I'm not doing this. This is way too hard because you're in a place that wasn't meant for you. They weren't expecting you. And it's the isolation, the marginalization that comes with that. The idea of like, I'm not sure. So this, you have to, and not that I wasn't sure, other people weren't sure. So this idea that you have to prove yourself over and over again, the kinds of things that people from marginalized groups experience a lot. But I have to say there was a part of what was really driving me was that, wait, if it was this hard for me, I need to be here. I need to succeed so that I can open the door for others and so that others could learn from my experience. And as hard as it might've felt for me during that time, I knew there were others before me who had it even worse and that open doors. So we have a responsibility actually as part of the way I looked at it to succeed so that you could help others but that there comes with a lot of pressure as well. So looking for ways to stay the, steady the course and, and sometimes I talk about making a way out of no way. It looks like how could you possibly do it? Dig in, it can be done. Um, so, so that's part of that journey and, and knowing, I can tell you things that I didn't have, I learned about, okay, this is what others should have. And I think that's actually informed my career as I've gone along. Uh -huh. uh, now, in, uh, so in, uh, let, let's talk about that just a little bit. So these things that you've, that you learned that you needed um, and that you then share with others, what, give us an example of one of those things, right? That um, as you took on the deanship or you took on university president, or you took on one of these new challenges, sure. Uh, what's something that you had to you had to you had to learn, and then you, you're able to share it with others to say that this isn't it actually isn't that hard. You just have to know. Have exactly. To know. So, 
So some of the things that that stood out to me was like, you need to be included. You need to be part of the conversation and not like, oh, what's the weather like? No, can you actually have a conversation with me about science? Mm -hmm. they, you, need, you need something as simple as that. You need role models and mentors. It really does make a difference. They don't necessarily have to look like you, but someone who can help socialize you into the profession, into the field, give you a sense of those unspoken rules, help you understand how to navigate a career path. Those things are really necessary. The idea that we collaborate with one another and science is collaborative, but to be included in a collaboration. And so we put so much emphasis on the individual, go figure it out, this kind of sink or swim mentality. And so what I learned, especially things that I use and I think all leaders need to do institutionally, you shouldn't put the onus all on an individual. This, these structural issues are really important. And we as leaders can affect change. We can do things that remove structural impediments. We can create environments that are more supportive and inclusive so that anyone, regardless of their background, can succeed. And at the end of the day, it's a humanistic thing. Like we're just all humans. We just wanna get along, belong and, and participate. And so that's some of the things that I feel like really come to fore in terms of learning from those experiences, what's needed and then how to help others do that. Yeah, you, know, you talked about um, uh, some of those, some of those uh, structural changes. I think we should come back to that um, because I think that's, that's gonna be really about the current and the future. Um, in the past, one more question about the past. You, you, you mentioned that um, uh, in, your, in your Wikipedia that there was a teacher who told you you shouldn't go into, uh, you know, into, into these particular subjects. Um, I suspect that as you became more uh, successful and achieved more, the, the, the feedback wasn't quite so blunt. But, were there, <laughs> but, but were, there, were there places where you felt like, even when people didn't mean it, they were, they were guiding you a certain way that wasn't the direction you wanted to go? Does that still exist? That absolutely exists and it's subtle and it's harder to identify, but it's there. And if you, if you, if you have a lived experience where you have you've become accustomed to the marginalization, you know how to spot it actually. And some of it is as simple as your research is relevant, but we're not include, going to include you in that collaboration. And worse yet, we might take your ideas, go write a grant on it, get the funding. And you know what? You're just not part of it. So there are other things that there's messages that get sent of who we recognize and who we tout. So you toil in a way, lifting up everyone else, but not getting the recognition. Those things do matter. And people will say, oh, it doesn't matter who gets the credit. Yes, it does. And so the ones who say that the most is because everybody's giving them the credit, even if they don't deserve it. So it's like those things do matter. And, and actually people have shown that it's not always about performance and confidence. Sometimes it's about the recognition. Yeah. And part of that recognition helps with a professional identity, how we see ourselves as scientists or engineers. It's not just us seeing ourselves as that, that way. You need that outward recognition as well. And so there's subtle things that happen, even things like a professor not making eye contact with the student, something as subtle as that, or a student saying, you know, I think I want to go to graduate school. And someone saying, well, I don't think you're going to be good at graduate school and not really having something to base that on. So those kinds of subtle things, harder to see and name, but they definitely happen. Yeah. Are there, um, uh, as, as you were making your way through these processes, you know, policy change, we we're talking about policy today. Um, uh, were there policies that changed that um, that maybe opened the door or closed the door or that you, you saw a real sort of manifestation of a policy change making a difference in, a, in your career? So I start, so I didn't necessarily see anything specifically around policy that I felt like opened a door for me or not. But I'll tell you what I started to learn about policy. I started looking at things at the institutional level, policies and practices, that's policy. What happens at local state levels, what happens at national levels, and then started to understand like just looking back at what are policies that really do impact people's career paths, 
like a policy that says separate but equal, you know, like, and then uh, Brown versus the Board of Education uh, takes that out. But then let's bring it back to something a little bit more current around policies. So I don't know how much people pay attention to this, but 2007, there was the American Competes, Competes Act. 2005, there had been a National Academies report uh, rising above the gathering storm that started looking at the United States losing competitiveness in the scientific enterprise in the arena. So out of the Competes Act, there was some attention being paid to STEM education. So that means that the country started saying, wait, we should be paying more attention to how we're educating in STEM. And then in 2010, that act was um, redone, reauthorized. So I started to look at, oh my goodness, there are all these policies that we as scientists and engineers are just going about our business and not really paying attention to how those policies are being enacted and actually influencing our own field and our discipline. So the more that we know about that and the more that we involve ourselves in the policy process, or at least understanding it, the better chances we have of doing something because policy can actually be a catalyst, it can be an enabler, and then use wrong, it can actually keep people down and perpetuate inequities. So looking at policy that way, I think is really important. Yeah, yeah you, know, I, I, you say it in such a nice way, you know, growing up, uh, in the in the Senate, you know, I spent ten years working in the Senate. It was uh, either be at the table or on the table, right? That's right, uh, exactly. Yeah, yeah, that was the the not so nice way of putting it. Uh, you've already had two quotes, but yeah, the the one it, we say that credit who gets the credit doesn't matter. It does matter. It does matter, particularly when it's important. And I think uh, we we need to make sure we're um, we're saying that because I think it's hard, right? Especially in this in this day and age where we are supposed to share credit, and and it is you know it is a lot of teamwork, but. Exactly but we need to make sure that people get the credit when they deserve it. Um, there's a question in the, in the Q&A. I'm going to go ahead and start just pulling a couple of these. It's, it's relevant. Uh, the first is that, um, you know, we talked a bit about you being the first of, of several things. Um, you know, one of the, and, and, and they're saying that's just an amazing feat, but uh, it's also important to be the second and the third and the hundredth right. and the thousandth. Right, exactly. Uh, uh, how do we, what advice do you have uh, to, to sort of, uh, you know, help people understand that that's important? Um, and how do we remind ourselves that continuing a legacy and frankly expanding upon it uh, is as important as starting it? Yeah, I think that we need to amplify our voices. We need the individual and the collective voices. I think we need to hold people accountable and we need to demand. It's, it's, time, it's way past time for talking. It's time for action. We need to be courageous. We need to say, this is what it takes to open doors. And once you open the doors, it's not just enough to let people in. You have to create those kinds of environments where people can actually thrive so that they do have the career paths to stay. We have to be courageous and push and we have to hold our leaders accountable. There are programs that exist that we know like there's certain interventions. Well, do them and do more of them. And if, they, if they're not working, then add more. And then back to policy. Sometimes it's not that you don't have policies and practices. They're not applied equitably. So if you apply them more equitably, that makes sense. And then if you have one that's not equitable, get rid of it and create new policies and practices. Yeah. So there are ways for us to come together and do this. And it takes like the willingness to do it. It's not like we don't know what to do in many ways. It's just like, just do it and then hold folks accountable to that. Yeah, let's, let's turn to the, the current and the future. So uh, we, we titled this Science by All and for All. Uh, what does that mean to you, Gilda? What, 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 is that, what is that science by all and for all? What does that mean and, and why is it important? So to me, it's like anyone who wants to practice science has the opportunity to do it. It's about access, it's about opportunities. I'm not saying everybody has to be a scientist. But if they want to be a scientist, they should have every door open to them and no doors closed. And also, I think it's important for us to be scientifically literate, whether we're a scientist or engineer or not. I think part of the problem we have with the country right now, like what is this assault on knowledge, on education, on truth? And so we need to stand up for what's right. And science 
and engineering can be used as a tool to do the right thing, to get that knowledge out there. So I, I really think it's important for us to, to make sure that the opportunities are widely spread and that we have the scientific literacy. And, and also that us as scientists, we have literacy in other areas as well. We cross disciplines, we ensure that doors are open, we don't close the doors so that we have the best talent pool we can absolutely have. Where on earth would it make sense to just leave talent untapped when we need it, especially when the problems that we're facing are becoming more and more complex? Yeah, it makes so much sense. You know, I, when, I, when I think about it, I think in terms of, um, you know, we have for the longest time, you know, we've had science going forward in progress in the United States, and we have made a ton of mistakes, and we've learned a lot of lessons, and we have a lot of lessons to learn, but we learn those lessons when we have the aperture widened about the kind of science that's important. And if you don't have a diverse set of people looking at that aperture and saying, look, you know what, uh, health disparity research is just as important as discovering the, the next subatomic particle. Uh, if you don't have that aperture wide enough and you're not gonna be able to see science that could actually help everyone, right? So um, exactly. we've had some science and technology advances only help a certain small number of people. How do we get them to help a broader, uh, a broader uh, group of people? Uh, so I think that it's just so important that we, we're paying attention to that, especially whenever right now we're drawing, we're drawing our scientists from such a small section of our population uh, you know, you, you mentioned it. I think uh, uh, Ponch, the new director of the NSF, calls it the missing millions. Exactly. We have, yeah, we're you know we, we should be drawn from all parts of our population. We're in a global competitive environment. We need we need a hundred percent of our population to be drawn uh, scientists from, not just a small portion. And um, I think we need to make visible what's invisible. Like I was talking about some of those impediments that people don't see. We need to make that visible. We need to make it visible that we're leaving people, uh, you know, we're leaving untapped talent on the table. We need to make visible that there are opportunities and open these doors. And, you know, I think what's really important too is like getting in the door and having a seat at the table. Like one of the reasons why I started pursuing policy in particular and why I'm so excited about these students in the network doing it, this young generation, but why I started was like, wait a minute, there are policies and practices that are impacting not just what I want to do going forward, but those coming behind me. I want to be where that's happening. I want to be in the room where they're talking about this stuff. And so I actually started doing things like um, the American Society for Engineering Education, for example, there's an engineering dean's council. I get on that, I get myself on the science policy committee. FASEP, I was working with that group. I get on the science policy committee. So everywhere I was involved, it's like how do I get involved in the policy aspect of that organization or understanding what's happening uh, broader within institutions and outside institutions locally and so on, because you need that seat at the table. And one organization I was actually president of, the AIMB, is the American Institute, Institute for Medical and Biological Engineering, is an advocacy organization. So using our power, there's nothing stopping us from getting involved in using our power and our voice to affect policy, which can again be a catalyst for change. When when you were doing this, uh, Gilda, were were there a lot of people of your generation who were clamoring to to get involved in policy who, who were in academia, or was it a, a small number of people that were trying to get involved? It was a small number of people, and actually, another reason why I'm so excited about this group and the students who are involved. Many students get it they know we need change and they're eager for the change and they're willing to put their time and energy toward it. So we need to encourage that. So I, I give you a, a good example in my, in my own career. I had a graduate student who was very much interested in policy and many were saying to her, like, you can't do that. You can't get a PhD and do policy as well. Not only did she excel at getting her PhD, she got a certificate in policy and she went on to do other great things related to policy and combining that um, policy with the scientific technical expertise. We need more of that. We need people to see there are multiple pathways and we need our faculty to see that there it's strength. Like you, you get a stronger student by letting them pursue those kinds of activities and interests that can only strengthen them as scientists and engineers. 
as a um, as the president of a college guild, uh, uh, that's uh, that. I don't know if that's a minority view or not, but it may be. You know, I'm just thinking back to my own time in academia. Uh, it wasn't seen as uh, as as something that was worth spending your time on. You should be spending your time on on just the research. Um, do you think that's changing? And uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to the NSPN folks telling us if it's changing. So I think it's slow because I, 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 I would imagine that many of our members of, of the network can say that they're not necessarily encouraged. But what I want to applaud them on is coming together collectively because there's strength in numbers. There's also strength in data. There's strength in knowledge. There's strength in say, calling it out, calling it out for what it is, saying, no, look, this is how we can make a difference and then showing the difference that's being made. The fact that this group is growing and getting bigger and bigger, that's awesome. I think students driving change is important. I also think leaders driving change. So just imagine if we had the presidents and other leaders driving change along with the students driving change, just imagine how strong that would be and the, the difference we could make. Also, tying in with the professional societies like the work that you're doing with AAAS. That's awesome, this idea that we're gonna tackle systemic racism, we're gonna call it out, and we're not gonna apologize for saying that we're gonna call it out and tackle it. We're gonna tackle it with data, we're gonna tackle it with our activities, and we're going to make a difference. We're not talking, we're gonna have action. So that's a model for others. And that's something I wanna be a part of. And I think there are others as well. We need to get them to join in. Yeah, uh, you know, it, I've um, in, in going through this and the AAAS. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we are uh, we are looking at the demographics of our own institution and our own organization and our everything about us. And it's all on our website. It's all um, it's all uh, publicly available. What I've noticed is that there's there's real challenges around this discussion, right? It gets it gets hard fast, and it gets awkward fast, and it gets defensive fast. Um, uh, you know, in, in your own uh, in your own work, Gilda, um, how do you talk about systemic racism? And what are the you know what what do people you know? Sometimes I get uh, I often get the feedback. What do you mean systemic racism? It's not you know it's it's, it's just there's a couple of bad apples here and there. Um, what, what do you what what is your what is your thought about what systemic racism is? And how do you know it when you see it? Sure, like what I think is. I always go back to history. Like, why, why can't we learn from our history? Why can't we just look at what happens when we have rules and regulations and policies and practices and laws that were put in place to disadvantage certain groups and advantage others? Laws and practices that were put in place so that you don't have the same opportunities as others, like redlining uh, in terms of where you can get a house which then impacts where you get, how you get educated. That's there, it's tangible, you can see it. So for us to act like, oh, I don't know how this happens. Like, oh, here's how it happens. And to explain how that impacts. Also another area that I looked in was health disparities. Like I, I mentioned sickle cell research that I was doing. It's a public health concern, the disparate ways that people receive treatment or not and how treatment is impacted by race. So there, there are concrete things that we can point to that demonstrate. And then it's more like, okay, what's the appetite for doing something about it? And to be clear and not back off. So then when we have the conversations, start with fact. And, and so sometimes people don't believe the facts, you know, but we don't stray away from the facts. We don't lose sight of the truth and we make it a safe space to have a conversation. We have to keep the dialogue, even though if it's tough, it's like, okay, it's tough. Take a break, talk again. We have to keep that dialogue going and find some common language around it. So I, I guess it's important is what you were saying, like, how do you talk about it? But I think language is important. And I don't think we should like call it something else to make it palatable to somebody's ears. Call it for what it is, because every time we dilute what we're talking about, we make it that less of a, a good chance for us to be effective in changing it. Yeah, and that's that's the hard part, right? It, you know, one of the things I learned in, in putting together our own data is that it's very easy to obfuscate some of the trends, right? To right. Uh, you know, you can you can as a as a leader, you want to show success, you want to show 
progress. And so you said, well, we're doing really well on the gender axis. Let's let's talk about gender. <laughs> let's not let's not talk about race. Let's talk about gender for a while, um, or, or wherever you're doing well. And 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 we we have to sort of be able to as leaders be willing to put ourselves out there and say, look, we're we're actually failing at this. We're, exactly. we're not doing a good job. Uh, and that's hard. I, I don't know how you how how do you deal with that? How do you how do you how are you willing to say Ugh, we're we're not doing a good job at this yet? So it's it is absolutely hard. But here's how I deal with it. I feel like I have the right to complain because I'm working on it. And so so I feel like we should free people up. Admit it. It's mm -hmm. tough. We're not doing a good job. Okay, get past that. What are we going to do about it? Yeah. And so if we acknowledge, sometimes a lot of it is just not even acknowledging. A lot of times I think there's a problem with people not being able to acknowledge what they're not experiencing themselves. So just because you don't experience it, you do, that doesn't mean that someone else is not experiencing it. And being open enough to say someone might experience this world, this society differently. Mm -hmm. And it might be something that's unfair and I might be able to use my privilege to help someone else. So I think, you know, just that kind of sharing and it does go back to just basic, decent, humanistic approaches, like just one person being decent to another person because it's another human being. Mm -hmm. You know, like sometimes we try to make things so complicated, yeah. but it is, it goes back to just respecting one human and respecting another. And I always say science is social. Science is like humans doing science for humans, it's social. And we are working in a political context. So recognizing it, recognize it, call it out for what it is, and then move on and do something with that. Yeah, no, I really appreciate that. And one of the things I've found is that I have to remind folks that, that accentuating or talking about the stories of one group doesn't diminish exactly. or devalue the stories and narratives of any other group. Um, those are still valid and still very important stories. Uh, uh, it's just that we haven't highlighted this, this area. Let's, let's do that for a little bit. Um, so, uh, in, in, in one of the things you told me about, uh, is when you were going to take on this, this role at, at Olin, that you had an interview process, uh, and that you, so you talked about what you were going to emphasize. Yes. And, you know, sometimes we talk about diversity and inclusion and that's sort of on the side, right? We're going to, we're going to do this, this, and this, and then, oh, and there's diversity and inclusion. We care about that as well. So, could, would you mind sharing that story about the, about the interview and then sort of what, what you put front and center? No, I don't mind at all. I think it's very important for us to bring our authentic selves to the wherever we're going. And I was very clear about what my priorities were, including things like access and equity and making uh, the scientific enterprise engineering being a more accessible discipline. I was clear that justice makes a difference to me, social justice, and in particular, what we do around racial and ethnic justice. And that I saw being able to transform how we approach engineering education would be a great vehicle for that. And I was so pleased that I was joining a community that valued me for all of that and said, great, that's what we want. This is what we want in a leader. This is where we're going. I'm like, great, because that's what you're getting. <laughs> and so I think it's really important for us to be able to take a stand, to stand for something to be able to say, we want justice, social justice is important, and we're not just gonna talk about it, we're gonna actually do something about it. And the authenticity, I think, makes a huge difference in whether or not you're really serious to, to actually affect some change. So I felt being brought here, they're ready for some change. Mm -hmm. And we'll see just how ready as we go along. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, a question from the Q&A that's related. You mentioned that the onus of structural change should not fall on individuals, uh, particularly people of color. Uh, what advice do you have for people of color trying to make changes uh, in PWIs when each potential action is met with some pushback? Uh, how can people of color show allies how to support structural needs and policy changes without expending too much emotional labor? And I think that's a really important, this, this onus, it does add to emotional weight. It's, it, is a, it is a weight. Um, uh, it's a huge weight. And so I think we need both. It's a huge weight, but we do need to take some of the individual responsibility along with allies and, and along with um, getting support 
within our own community. And the reason why I say that is, would you want someone who says, oh, I know what you need. I haven't experienced anything that you've experienced. I don't live your life. I'm not in your environment, but I know what you need. So let's just do this. And you're okay with that. So I think we need those who, at the table who can best help direct what we need to do because they're experiencing that. We need that. But then we need others <laughs> along with that who are in the positions of power to use that power to amplify voices, to create the change that they can. So it's the power dynamic along with it. It's just like when we, you know, I go back to some of the medical examples because that's an area that I know. But if you're going to design a solution for a patient or someone who has a medical problem, do you not check with them about what the problem is? Like, are you just going to come up with some device and say, hey, I have this fancy new tool. I know how to use this. I don't know if it's going to help you with what your disease is or, or what, you know, what the, the, the problem that you have. So it's that combination that I think we need to work together. And what, when I talk about allyship, I'm like, again, sharing the power and the voice and have for these shared common goals, but listening to those who have the authentic experience to inform those solutions. Yeah, uh, it, you know, it, it's when I, when I think of that, that leadership dynamic uh, and how you, can, how you can amplify those voices um, having you there is, is wonderful. Um, even when we talked about firsts and seconds, you know, if we, if we talk about the present state, we're still, we're still really early in this, aren't we, Gilda? I mean, there's, there's yeah. relatively few leaders of color um, uh, if, at, the, at the pinnacle where you are um, that can amplify those voices. And it, after, you know, you're sort of starting in 1989, you're saying, um, do you feel like what do you think of that part? Is it, has it been, an, is, is this what you thought it would be? Did you think that by now there'd be, you know, uh, that we would look, that our leadership would look like America? What, what, what would you say to the, the sort of the lack of diversity still at the top levels? So I, I say that part of our problem is we've been doing too much lip service and not enough work because if you look at what's going on, our progress is flat and it's, it's in some cases going backwards. And so we need to say what's holding us back. We're holding ourselves back. We need action. And I think that's part of the problem. So I, I love it that there are more people who look like me who are coming behind me, but it bothers me that we're still trailing in progression. Like the numbers of African-Americans, for example, in leadership roles is minuscule. The numbers of African-Americans in full, um, full professor roles, it's minuscule. So the fact that we don't have the leaders in place, and I think part of it is we need longitudinal activities. We need, we don't, you don't just bring them in and say, oh, let me have some more enter the pathway, and then don't do anything to make sure that there's success as you go or that the environments don't push people back out. So while I'm encouraged and I have hope that we can come together and start actually doing things, I am a little bit distraught about the slow progress and the lack of progress over a period of time. You know, some of that could be um, uh, it could be the the critical mass of of people who are advocates who are uh, thinking about policy, and, and we've talked about just the student generation right now is mu much more energetic than my generation. I know that for a fact uh, on these issues. Um, the faculties. It can be, as we talked about just a little bit earlier, it can be a little bit um, of a block on that. Uh, there's a question in the Q&A that says, you said that we need to get the faculty on board. How do we do this? There doesn't seem to be, um, there doesn't seem to be insensitive mechanisms for faculty to back this up. Um, incentive, sorry. There doesn't seem to be incentive <laughs> mechanisms. That makes more sense. There doesn't seem to be incentive mechanisms for faculty to back this up. Um, yeah. That. So I think it's several things we need to do. Like we need to look at our reward structures, but how we incentivize uh, what gets what gets credit in the academy. So part of the problem is we've put so much focus on research and, and we measure research a certain way and that's it. And there's so much emphasis. If we would put some more emphasis on service, on moving the field forward, on mentoring, those kinds of things, I think we would start to move some behaviors. If we would even look at graduate education and how we could make that more effective in some ways. Our model, our apprenticeship model hasn't changed at all. 
maybe we should have more distributed um, advisement. So instead of that primary advisor, advisee, yes, there's a thesis committee, but it's really so much is controlled by the advisor, advisee. So if you have an advisor that says, you can't do this, you can't do that, then you don't get to do it at all. Why can't we distribute that, that mentorship a bit more? Vertically integrated mentorship where postdocs mentor graduate students, graduate students mentor undergraduates, all of this, but also like giving credit for that to say like this is important. Institutions, there's nothing stopping an institution from saying this is important and we're gonna recognize that. So when it's time for promotion, we're gonna pay attention to that. We're not gonna put the service all on the back of the few underrepresented minorities that we have or the few women that we have. We're gonna distribute that and have a shared responsibility and we're gonna give them credit for it. And we're not gonna let it derail their careers. And we're gonna be more inclusive. We're gonna be collaborative in how we do research. Team science, team science doesn't mean some people get to be on the team and others don't. So if we do those things collectively, I think it will make a difference. And I'm gonna go back to the student voice again because the students really can push. Can you imagine students pushing and so coming together, forcing faculty to have to take another look or forcing administrators to have to take another look because of the students and what they've done in their groundswell of work saying, you know what, we went off and did this and look at our outcomes. Yeah. I really do think we'll start to turn some heads. I, I think you're so right about that, Yilda. You know, I, I've been a proponent of, um, you know, I see this, this, um, this yearning of students to want to go into policy and I see them wanting to apply for AAAS s and policy fellowships and other, other mechanisms that we have in Washington. I always say that you know the local level is a wonderful place too, right? And if they were incentivized by their faculty and by uh, by the university to actually participate, I think it would go a long way towards rebuilding some of the trust between scientists and communities. Exactly. It, it solves several problems at once. I, I would I would love that. Um, there's a question in the Q and A that uh, that goes a little bit towards this, which is, um, uh, "Hi, Dr. Barabino. I'm an alum of CCNYBME." while you were the dean and now pursuing a PhD. Yay, that's fantastic. Uh, as you know, City College of New York and other public universities uh, like it are vibrant communities that are majority non-white, working class, and seen as, quote, just minority serving institutions, and maybe not as prestigious as some other top universities. How do we change the narrative that good students and scientists are coming from places like CCNY and that going to top schools is not the only path to success? Um, that's, yeah, I think it's that that's a very legitimate um, point. And those who are in positions to recognize those contributions should do it. That was one way to help. But another thing I think is really important, I said early on, like it was instilled in me even by my parents about excellence. I think that excellence can come anywhere. And so if, regardless of what type of institution we're in, if we strive for excellence, and get that work out. And I think it's really important, particularly for graduate students who are involved in research, get it documented, publish, because that record speaks for itself. And then you have that record that my parents used to say things like, get your education, no one can take that from you. You know, like, so getting that body and of knowledge, getting that body of contributions, and then using it to make a difference. Then people say, oh, that came from this place and they might be surprised from where it came from, but to keep getting that out there. And I think we all have a responsibility to recognize important work regardless of where it came from. And the more that we do that, the more that we highlight those kinds of achievements, the better. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, when I, the, the sense I get of, um, uh, of this, this generation of students is they're not gonna accept um, they're not going to accept that failure or that uh, that disincentive. They're going to they're going to keep at it. And uh, you know, I, I keep talking about how we, we're in a generational moment. Um, you know, they come they come along once in every generation at least. And some generations make huge progress, and mm -hmm. some generations fall flat. And the difference between the two is follow through. It's um, it's keeping the momentum. Uh, and this generation strikes me as one that is going to keep that. Uh, they're going to keep our feet to the fire. That's why we should be hopeful. <laughs> yeah. They definitely. are gonna keep our feet to the fire. Yeah. Um, there's another question in the q and I'll go to. Uh, it struck me that you both said um, that a lot of times there's a lack of acknowledgement of areas where programs, groups, et cetera, are failing. I saw this recently in my programs recruiting. They wanted to include how they reacted to COVID, 
the initial response wasn't very good, but they're getting, they're doing better now and only want to focus on the current. Whereas I think it shows development, recognition, and care to show an evolution of focus. That didn't go over very well. How can you encourage this type of thinking in the, if the people who have the power to make these changes are worried about the impact of acknowledging these problems? Yeah, I think we just have to keep at it. This is what I was saying earlier. It's like, you have to name it and you can't back off from it. And we have to learn from our history. We can't just pick one point in time. You know, we're scientists, we're engineers. We can't like cherry pick our data. Like, you know, like he's like, oh, I'm just gonna present this. I'm gonna leave all the rest of it out. And also from, in a, from a scientific way of looking at it, look at all the failures we have before we get to something that works. And so we need to learn from the failures as well. We need to learn from everything that's gone before us. And so I think just keeping that narrative there and we need to control the narrative. They're really, you said something earlier too, Sadeep, about the like stories. People connect with stories. People want to know about this person, their story. What's their story? I think that's one of the reasons why you started. Like, Gilda, can we hear your story? Yeah. People connect with one another with those stories. People use stories to help make sense of the world we're in. And then we can't leave out parts of the story and then think we're going to make a difference and make a difference in a way that is going to move us forward. Because it's the other thing, like you were saying, it's the follow through, the follow on. So I, I do think that us as scientists control our narrative and use it in a way to engage the public, to get the scientific trust um, that we need to educate. That's part of our job. And I think all of that together will actually help us continue to move forward. I love that. Um, Gilda, in the last uh, six minutes here, let's focus on the future a little bit. Um, uh, you know, now, now you, you took on this role in the summer uh, so just getting started, um, if you had two policy goals, whether it's, uh, you know, at, the, at home at the university or nationwide, what would those be? What are, what are the things that you think we should be focusing on and really put at the top of the list? So I actually would put equity at the top of the list. I really would. I would say we should all re internally review ourselves, re review, get our own houses in order around equity because there's so much that's driven by not having equity. I think inequality in the world is one of the biggest threats that we have. So we, because the inequality then impacts who has access to education, the wealth gap, health, all of those things. So my biggest emphasis would be on equity and how do we ensure equity and use it in ways that it opens doors and provides opportunities. Because that in itself would impact so many different things. Our environment, the educational structure, how we're, how we're caring for this world that we're in, that we're trashing at the rate that we're going, like if we don't do more around ways to be sustainable. I also think it's really important that education is accessible is accessible because in higher ed right now, it's getting such that it's out of reach of too many people. And that means we're leaving talent untapped. And that means we don't have the work, workforce that we need. And that means we're not gonna be able to have the talent and the perspectives to come up with the solutions we need to these increasingly complex problems. So that kind of access around education would be my highest priority because I do think it would feed into so many other ails that need to be addressed. Well, it makes so much sense, and it uh, it really speaks to the uh, to the theme of this of this conference that the NSPN has put together. Um, I, I think that um, I, you know many of us, uh, even in leadership and elsewhere, um, I think we've hit. I think we have hit an inflection point in this discussion where mm -hmm. I see people talking about this in ways that weren't talking about it even two years ago. Exactly. Um, and and I, I, don't think, I don't think it's possible for them to put the genie back in the bottle because uh, they're too out there. Uh, they've said too many words. And this is where I really applaud uh, the, 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 many of the students who forced, um, forced language out of this administrator's mouths uh, that I think they're gonna have to live up to. Uh, and I think that's really powerful. Um, I'm gonna end with uh, one last question for, from the Q&A and then, and then just let you close out. Um, uh, 
and it's it's really this um, uh, this question of collective action on the part of uh, on the part of students. You know, it's hard as leaders for us to, um, you know, it's it's hard to respond to collective action. So many university administrators are often against one of these most powerful tools of uh, organizing power, whether it's unionization or collective movements, because it it is challenging. Mm -hmm. um, but these these movements do have a lot of power, and they they can make change related to climate change or related to uh, systemic racism. Um, how do we, you know, how do we uh, how do we incentivize or acknowledge or uh, enable uh, those movements uh, and their wider role in society? I mean, because it, it is hard on a, you know, as a leader, boy, that's tough. I know it's tough. Gilda? Yes, absolutely. I think we support the collective uh, voices and don't tamp them down. Don't do things that um, makes it harder for them to come together because it's very difficult as, a, as an individual. There's so much backlash and it's, and that's a reason why people are afraid to go out there alone. But there's so much power in the collective voice. And so I think our supporting it and, and doing things that actually strengthen the collective voice will make a difference. And so I would encourage all of these folks who want to make a difference. That's part of why they're coming together so strongly because you have a group of committed people with shared goals and interests who want to make a difference. And right now they wanna make a difference around social justice and they're gonna do it. So I think that supporting it in every way we can is gonna make a difference as well. That's wonderful, thank you, Yelda. Um, you know, I, 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 I wanna second what you just said. I, I, love, I love seeing the, or the, the self-organizing, uh, the exactly. organic growth that I see uh, in this generation, uh, you know, using social media, not using social media, whatever, whatever method you use, uh, because it does hold our feet to the fire. Our train, you force us to be transparent as leaders, you can hold us accountable. Uh, and doesn't mean we're always gonna agree. Uh, it doesn't mean we're always gonna get to the same place at the same time, uh, but you've got two friends here in Gilda and me uh, that are, uh, are wanting to partner with you and wanting to be, um, uh, wanting to be champions with you uh, uh, with you as partners, not as, not as, uh, not as, uh, exactly. leaders. um, Gilda, I want to give you the last word here. Uh, you're the, you're the, the keynote. So, uh, <laughs> we, we did this because it's, it's, you know, 45 minutes is a long time on zoom for anybody to have to, uh, uh to, to talk by themselves. But, uh, what would your final thought be for this, uh, this terrific group of people who are, um, who've gathered? My final thought is like, stay brave and courageous, come together and push action. This is the kind of action that we need, and it will be successful. And as Sudeep just said, you have partners. We are partners, and there are others as well. So stay brave, continue the great action. There will be change. Thank you, Gilda. That was uh, such a fun conversation. I'm so glad we we're able to do it. Uh, My thank thanks. Yeah, and thank you to NSPN for, uh, for having us. Yeah, thank you, Gilda and Sudip, so very, very much for joining us. It was really wonderful to have you here today and to hear all of your, your thoughts. Thank you for to everyone else for engaging uh, with your questions. And um, Gilda and Sudip, you can be sure that we're going to do our very best to keep everyone's feet to the fire um, and with our follow through for change. So uh, it's uh, one o'clock Eastern time. So we're going to go ahead and get started uh, with our panel discussions. First, uh, we have um, recentering international narratives, examining the intersection between science, diplomacy, inclusion, and discovery. So, if you're interested in that panel, you can stay right here. Otherwise, to join Who's Knowledge, Who's Progress, um, Science as a Tool for Racism, you can find the Zoom link in the chat, or you can access that again through the Whova agenda.